Good morning. Welcome to worship today. And today we are worshiping on the third Sunday in the season of Lent. We're about midway in our journey to the cross with our Savior Jesus. You know, the cross is central to what it is that we believe and what it is that we preach. The message that is proclaimed here at Trinity is the message that Jesus Christ went to the cross for you and for me. Not everybody sees that message in the same way. To some, it's just offensive. To others, it's foolishness. And we'll hear about how important the message of the cross is for you and for me in our worship service today. The order of service is printed for you on the screens, order of service abbreviated with uh, the Lord's Supper. And we will begin by singing or by hearing our soloist sing this morning, Lift High the Cross. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the blessings that you have given to us through the cross of Jesus Christ. Make us faithful to you and teach us, Lord, to revere you for having sent him to the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. We ask this in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson for today comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. And here God gives to Moses and to the people of Israel the Ten Commandments. We're reminded that God is serious about his word, about every part of his word. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of our Lord. Please join with me now in speaking responsively the words of Psalm 19 as they appear on the screen. We hear in this portion of scripture also about God's voice. He speaks to us, first of all, in nature, but far more. He speaks to us in scripture. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. The law of the Lord is perfect, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. They are more precious than gold. They are sweeter than honey. By them is your servant taught. In keeping them, there is great reward. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my Redeemer. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Our second lesson comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. God's word is an offense to some, foolishness to others, but to us 
It is the power and the wisdom of God. This is a portion of God's word upon which the sermon will be based this morning. St. Paul writes these words. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. This is the word of our Lord. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Please stand now for the Gospel of our Lord. The Holy Gospel for this Sunday, the third Sunday in the season of Lent, is recorded in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Let's join now in confessing our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. 
Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Amen. Our text for this, the third Sunday in Lent, is recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. So far God's word, you may be seated. Dear friends in Christ, I often wonder what people from years ago would think of our world today. Imagine going back 100 years and engaging with fellow citizens of brilliant of that time. To help with perspective, the year is 1921. Warren G. Harding was president. Babe Ruth was playing baseball for the New York Yankees. Brillian had a population of approximately 1,100, and the Aaron's company wouldn't be founded for another 12 years. So you walk over to the train depot, which is about where the Econo Foods parking lot is now, and you begin speaking with your fellow Brillianites. You explain that you've come back from the future, and you have some interesting things to share. Remember, I said you have to use your imagination. So you offer, can you believe it? We've put a man on the moon. It's true. And it's now possible to speak to people on the other side of the world and see them at the same time. All you need is this little thing called an iPhone. It's a mini computer that you can carry in your pocket. And did you know that the average home in America now costs $340,000? What kind of response do you think you'd get? Wow, that's amazing. I can't wait for the future. Or do you think you'd hear, you're telling me we put somebody on the moon? You're now saying that we can speak to someone on the other side of the world and see them at the same time. And you're telling me that's what people are now going to have to pay for a new home? Nope. I don't believe you. Not a single word. You're talking foolish. Let's face it, some things are just so outlandish, so far out there, they cannot possibly be true. Here's another example. Did you know that the God who created the world and everything in it once sent his son to earth to save mankind from sin? It's true. Do you know how he did it? He was captured, beaten, Put to death on the cross by a very people he came to save. He was buried in another man's tomb. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. What do you think? Let's be honest. Doesn't that sound at least a little far-fetched? God coming to earth, suffering and dying for the very people he created? That just raises all kinds of questions. Why would God do that? Why would he even put himself into that position to be put to death on a cross like a criminal? He's God. Why didn't he just snap his fingers and declare us all to be saved? Why did he have to die? Do you people really believe this? Don't you understand how foolish this sounds? Yes. We do understand how someone else might find this to be foolish. And we believe it. We know it to be true. On this third Sunday in Lent, we'll explore what has become a stumbling block for many and what for us is the foundation of our faith. Today we review the message of the cross. And we'll discover it's not what human wisdom wants to hear, yet it is exactly what sinners need to hear. Let me set the scene. It is the first century. 
The gospel is beginning to spread throughout the Mediterranean world and Christians are eagerly sharing their faith about Jesus who suffered, died, and rose again from the dead. However, the message was getting mixed reviews. The Apostle Paul acknowledged as much when he wrote, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. First of all, let's make sure we all understand what the message of the cross is. It's really very simple. It is this. God the Father sent his own son, Jesus, to earth to suffer and die in payment for the sins of the world. That's it. That's the message. By the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, we have been led to believe that message. We have been led to believe that Jesus Christ is exactly the Son of God and the Savior of the world. We know the message of the cross to be the only way to salvation. We know that. We do believe it. And it is the message that we want to hear over and over again, especially during this Lenten season, as we retrace Jesus' steps to the cross. But you know, not everyone believes it. Some people don't even want to hear it. And you know why? Why? It's because of the cross. It's because they cannot or they refuse to try to wrap their heads around the fact that Jesus' death is what saves. They don't see how that's possible. So they conclude it's illogical. It's senseless. It's foolishness. Therefore, it cannot be true. Our text tells us about Jews and Greeks who both wrestled with this same message, but for different reasons. For centuries, the Jewish people had been watching and waiting for a Messiah, someone who would become a mighty warrior, someone who would restore the kingdom of Israel to its former position of power and glory, even greater than that of David and Solomon. But when Jesus appeared on the scene, He didn't talk about insurrection. He didn't try to raise an army. Instead, he talked about repentance and a heavenly kingdom. And so the Jews who actually did listen to him concluded that he couldn't possibly be the Messiah. But just in case he was, they wanted proof. Paul writes, the Jews demand miraculous signs. And Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. The Jews wanted some kind of sign, some kind of proof that Jesus really was the Christ. Where was his army? Where were all his followers? As far as they could tell, they only had a few, he only had a few, and most of them were fishermen. But wait a minute. Didn't Jesus give them all kinds of signs while he was still alive? Didn't he heal the sick? Didn't he cast demons out of people? Didn't he feed thousands with next to nothing and then have more food at the end than when he even started? Didn't he once raise Lazarus from the dead? Didn't he do things which only God could do? What more proof did they need? Jesus performed all kinds of miracles. He gave them all kinds of signs that he was really the Christ. They just didn't want to believe. Didn't they see these signs? The answer is yes. The people saw them. Lots of people saw them. The Jews had no choice but to acknowledge the miracles Jesus performed and the one his disciples did after he was gone. But instead of believing, they simply hardened their hearts. They didn't want to believe that Jesus could be the Christ. He couldn't be. He didn't get rid of the hated Romans. If he had, they might have looked at him differently, but he didn't. As far as they were concerned, he was just a fraud who deserved to die. And he did, on a cross. The Greeks, on the other hand, were impressed by oration and philosophical ideas. They were looking for the next Aristotle or Socrates, someone who would challenge them and open their minds to new possibilities. So, okay, the Christians were sharing something new. But when they heard the message of the cross, it turned them off. It didn't make sense God's son coming to earth, suffering and dying for the people he created, it was illogical. And then when it was explained to them how he died, why would they want to put their faith in a guy who seemed so inept that he ended up getting put to death on a cross? 
And you know what? They were right. The message of the cross is illogical. It doesn't make sense. And you know why? Because it takes human reason, logic, and man's efforts to achieve salvation completely out of the process, which is exactly the point. And that, Paul says, is the beauty of God's plan of salvation. He writes, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Isn't it amazing how God made something which appeared to be so foolish and weak by human standards to be the very plan that saves the entire world from sin? Who could have ever come up with such a plan of salvation? Who could have ever made something like this work? No one other than the true God. And think about it. Out of all the religions in the world, no other God has their God die for its people. But God sent Jesus to do just that. Amazing. Mind-blowing. Life-changing. The message of the cross is not what human wisdom wants to hear. Yet, it is exactly what sinners need to hear. We have a cross right here, a beautiful cross, and it catches a person's eye the moment they walk in the sanctuary. It is the focal point of this entire church. Now, I wonder, why is it that when some people take a look at the cross, it becomes an obstacle, uh, a stumbling block, an obstacle of faith? Why is that? My guess is, is because it's maybe what they see when they look at it. For some people, they look at the cross and they see it as a symbol of failure, ineptness, torture, horror, and death. However, we see it differently. We see the cross as a symbol of unconditional love, of power and grace, of victory. How can that be? The reason is, by God's grace, we have been led to see ourselves for what we really are. Sinful human beings unable to save ourselves. We realize that because of our own ineptness, we deserve to spend eternity in hell. But God the Father could not bear that thought, so he did something about it. He said, I'll send my son. I'll have him become human. I'll have him live the perfect life. And then I'll punish my son so that his death counts for everyone else. The sins of the world will be placed on my son and the world will receive his holiness. And the vehicle that will bring this all about is the cross. Now notice, there is not anything that you or I can do to contribute to or participate in our own salvation. It has all been done for us. Because of Jesus, our sins are gone. We are now considered once more to be perfect and holy in God's sight. This is really the message of the cross. However, we still have a problem. How do we lead other people to see this? How do we lead people to recognize that the message of the cross is really about unconditional love and not about weakness and failure? Christians are leaving the church. Our own church body has seen a decline in membership. Our own congregation has seen a steady decline in our average weekly worship attendance, even before COVID. Why is that? The reasons vary. Some are looking for something new. Others find fault. They think the church of today is no longer in touch with today's culture. They see the church today as being too stuffy, too judgmental, not inclusive enough. And still others, they don't feel engaged. They're not getting anything out of worship. So what do we do? Ignore the problem and just hope it goes away? Or do we take an honest look at this criticism and seek to better connect with those we serve? That sounds like a plan. But what about our message? Do we change our message? Do we try to make the message more appealing? Do we try to refocus our ministry to feed the hungry and and house the homeless? No. That's not what Scripture directs us 
to do. We will continue to point people to the cross and encourage them to lay their sins there and find great comfort in knowing their sins have already been forgiven for Jesus' sake. Our message cannot change. We will continue to preach Christ crucified. And we will continue to encourage and invite those we love and meet to come and hear it too. We are nothing. We have nothing. And on our own we can do nothing. Yet because of the message of the cross, we have been made something. Because of Jesus, we are blood-bought souls. We are children of God and heirs of eternal life. There is a reason this cross holds the most prominent place in this church. Always has. Always will. Until Jesus either comes again or calls us home. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding guard and keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. And for the prayers. Today in our intercessory prayers we include Steve Brandis who is recovering from surgery, Cheryl and Joe Brazil who've been blessed with the gift of a baby boy Calhoun Joseph, and Alyssa Kedrowski who continues to hold a call to San Diego, California. We pray. Lord God, we fully understand that we are living in a complex world. Try hard as we might, we simply cannot understand the glory of all that you have created. People still try. Unfortunately, many choose to put their trust and hope in worldly wisdom. And then when they hear the message of the cross, they choose to ignore it. Yet by your grace, Lord, you have led us to see the wisdom of the cross came into this world freely and willingly and then gave up your life so that those who believe might live forever with you in heaven. Everything we believe in, everything we hope for, absolutely everything revolves around the message of the cross. Let it be said in this church that in this church we preach Christ crucified and may we continue to preach it until you either come again or call us home. We ask this, Lord, in your name. 
We further pray today that you continue to be with Steve Brandis as he recovers from surgery. Enable him, Lord, to withstand any more discomfort that you and your wisdom might see fit for him to bear. And we pray that you grant him a complete recovery. We also join with Cheryl and Joe Brazil and give thanks that you have blessed them with a baby boy. Thank you for bringing both mother and child safely through delivery. And we now look forward to that day when Calhoun becomes your own through the sacrament of holy baptism. May he also prove to be a blessing to his parents and they to him. We also come before your throne and ask that you be with Alyssa Kidrowski as she contemplates the call to serve elsewhere. Guide her, Lord, and may she once again realize what a privilege it is to serve you and share your love with those under her care. We ask these things in your name as together we now join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 